Hey, anatomy and physiology students, welcome to lecture video set number two, which is all about cells and cell membranes and transporting things in and out of cells. All right, this is going to be a good one. So here's the deal. Why are we talking about cells? Well, all life is cellular. Whether you are a human being, a coelacanth, or an amoeba, you are made out of cells. We know human beings are made out of approximately 40 trillion cells. This is roughly 40 trillion cells right here. Other animals are also made of cells, whether it's one cell or many. Well, all animals are made out of many cells. We are multicellular. But all life is made out of cells. Let's talk about cells for a bit. Let's do it. One important thing that we got to know about cells is a cell is a discrete structure. So it has to have something separating its inside and its outside. And that thing doing the separating is the cell membrane, which we see right here. It is going to separate our extracellular space from our intracellular space. So extracellular on the outside, intracellular, obviously, on the inside. So intracellular in here. The extracellular space is filled with extracellular fluid. So we got to keep that extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid separate and the cell mem membrane is going to do that for us. Okay, speaking of that extracellular fluid, there are two main types of fluid that we're going to find surrounding the cells that make up our body. Two main types. One, in our blood vessels, good old blood. Good old blood. We'll talk a lot about blood when you take anatomy and physiology. Number two, maybe you'll take it with me. Maybe you'll have had enough of me and want a refreshing, refreshing change of pace and take it with somebody else. So, blood in the blood vessels. Then there's another kind of fluid that we find outside our cells called interstitial fluid. The fluid between, inter means between, the stuff. All right, we got to talk about that guy a little bit. Let's do it. Let's talk. So, interstitial fluid is also called tissue fluid. Okay? So, we have... A bunch of cells here. Check out the purple nuclei. Of course, purple nuclei, we know that from the histology we've done. And inside the cells, we're going to have intracellular fluid. Outside the cells, we're going to have interstitial fluid, also called tissue fluid. Now, that's appropriate because if I have a bunch of cells like I do here with a common structure, common function, then it makes sense that I have a tissue, and the fluid within that tissue would be tissue fluid. Tissue fluid is going to surround these cells, thus it's going to surround and bathe our tissues and our organs. This is a blood vessel right here. It's got blood in it. The liquid part of blood is often called plasma, in case you were wondering about that word. Okay, let's keep going. What's in this tissue fluid? What's in this liquid around our cells? Our 40 trillion cells that make up our body? Lots of stuff. First of all, first and foremost, it is water. We are watery creatures. Water is fantastic. It's hard to change water's temperature. That's good for homeostasis. Water's great at dissolving stuff. So we can put a lot of important things and dissolve it in our tissue fluid. Sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, all these beautiful electrolytes. Electrolytes. My handwriting when I draw, when I write with the mouse, it's just atrocious. Electrolytes. I can read that though. Sugar, like glucose. Wastes, like ammonia. Gases, these two gases that we know and love. So all this stuff and more is in interstitial fluid. Now, one of the purposes 
of interstitial fluid is to make sure that you get the right amount of stuff inside the cells. Okay, cells have to have the right levels of things. That's our H word right there, homeostasis. Okay? Cells have got to be in homeostasis. For cells to be in homeostasis, we got to have the right stuff inside the cells, which means we have to have the right stuff outside the cells in the interstitial fluid, which means our blood has to always bring and take away stuff to replenish, to regulate the interstitial fluid. That way we keep our cells okay, tissues okay, okay, organs okay, we stay alive. All right. I said we're going to talk about cells today. So far, we've been talking about the stuff around the cells, the fluid, which is fine, which is good. Well, let's keep going. Ah, there we go. Inside the cell, of course, we got our nucleus, appropriately colored, a beautiful dark purple here, because that's the color the nucleus appears in histological section. The nucleus, of course, contains the cell's DNA, which has the genes which code for the proteins, which are the workhorses of the cell. Inside the cell but outside the nucleus, we have our cytoplasm, our cell stuff. Basically, that's what that means. And inside our cytoplasm, we find the little organs, which we know and love as organelles. You should be able to recognize and know what that guy does right there because we talked about him already. There's another one right there. If you don't remember, if you want a hint, it starts with the letter M. And, of course, this guy right here, this blue studded with red things. You should remember what he is if you want a hint. I'll give you the initials right there. So organelles plus intracellular fluid on the inside of that cell. Okay. What we're really interested in, as far as cells go, is homeostasis. Having the right amount of stuff on the inside and the, and the outside. And maintaining homeostasis is going to require the movement of stuff in and out. In order to move stuff in and out, we're going to have to talk about the plasma membrane also known as the cell membrane. Cell membrane, plasma membrane, same thing. And its basic job is to separate your extra and your intracellular fluid. So, time to talk about the structure of the plasma membrane. There are two main components. There is a lipid component and a protein component. We're going to briefly deal with both of them. Okay. The membranes in our... The membranes. The lipids in our cell membranes, most of them are these special lipids known as phospholipids. Now, I've drawn a picture of a phospholipid here, like its chemical structure. A phospholipid kind of looks like a balloon with two strings. And the balloon part, the round part, is called the phosphate group. It's going to have a phosphorus-containing compound. Not really worried about the chemistry so much. And then stretched off that phosphate group are a pair of fatty acids. They're called fatty acid tails. And the most important thing about this chemical structure is that there is a dichotomy that exists here, a difference, if you will. The phosphate part, the phosphate head, is water-loving. It is hydrophilic. The, fa the fatty acid part, the tails, is water-hating, water-fearing, hydrophobic. So two different parts here, a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part. This is going to be crucial. Okay. Could you set up a cell membrane that was a monolayer, so a single row, of... Phospholipids. 
So remember, the purpose of the the purpose of the cell membrane is to separate the ECF, which is mostly water, from the ICF, which is mostly water. All right. Got a little assignment for you here. I want you to answer this question for me. And send me your answer. You can just write write an email for me, okay? Write me an email. Send me your answer to this question. Write it in your own words. Don't Google this and plagiarize something. Um, people do that all the time. Sometimes not a lot. Sometimes I catch them. Sometimes I don't, but I might. So don't just Google and plagiarize. Think about it. I've actually given you a hint. Like literally, if you look at the screen right now, there is a huge hint. That's a terrible two. I just noticed that's a terrible two right there. But I actually gave you a huge hint why this arrangement just stinks. It's a huge source of, of unhappiness in the on the screen right now. Um, I know. <laughs> anyway, all right. So email me your answer. This is an extra credit assignment. This is an extra credit assignment. When should it be due? This is due by the end of September 4th, 9-4. So if you're watching this for the first time on September 5th, sorry, you're out of luck. All right, your answer to this, email it to me by the end of September 4th. Okie dokie. Let's keep going. There we go. All right, what is beautiful is the actual structure of the membrane. The cell membrane is a bilayer of phospholipids. Check it out. We got the phosphate heads, the hydrophilic part on the outside here, interacting with the water of the ECF. And then we have their tails right here. Then we have another set of tails. So they're facing opposite directions here. And then another set of hydrophilic heads interacting with the water that is right here. We're separating water from water. It is very hard for the water in here to go like this. It's hard for it to go like this or to go like that. We are not doing allowing that because of the hydrophobicity, the hydrophobicness of these tails. So we got to have a bilayer of phospholipids to make a beautiful membrane that separates ECF on the outside and ICF on the inside. All right. Couple quick things. Here is a bilayer of phospholipids. This is the, the cell membrane structure here. Hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails, hydrophobic tails, hydrophilic heads. Now, one thing to notice about these phospholipids, they're not static. They can spin. So the, the phospholipids can spin. These guys up here can kind of diffuse around, like this guy can go boop, 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 over to here. Pretty much the only thing that can happen is the phospholipids over here cannot switch pace, cannot switch places. I said switch paces. I don't even know what that means. They cannot switch places with the phospholipids down here because that would mean the hydrophilic head went through this hydrophobic area. So you can't flip-flop them. Other movement is possible. And this this fluidity, this dynamic nature, the, the fact that it's not static, is going to be important when we think about how things get in and out. In other words, get through this membrane. All right, cool. Done with the phospholipids. But that's not it. That is not all. There are also going to be other things, including proteins, sugars, and cholesterol. And we're going to talk about the three of them. The combination of 
all of these different things that makes up the plasma membrane. So the fact that we have a, whoops, which way did I go? I just like smacked my mouse. I was getting so excited. My hands were gesticulating. Where was I? Food mosaic model. The fact that we have many components, phospholipid bilayer, proteins, the blue things are proteins, sugars, look at that grain sugar right there, and molecules of cholesterol, the old guys tucked in there. The fact that we've got many things is why this is referred to as a mosaic. Did you take art class yet? Maybe. Do you know what a mosaic is? It's basically like it's this picture and it's usually made by arranging little colored pieces of hard material, stone, tile, but they're little different bits. And because there's little different bits, this is called a mosaic. Because of the dynamicness of the phospholipids and also the proteins as well, that's why we have the word fluid here. So our cell membrane, which separates the inside of our, our cell from the outside, which is crucial for homeostasis, which is crucial for life, is a fluid mosaic structure. Okay. Let's talk about the other components. Starting with cholesterol. You need cholesterol. Cholesterol gets a bad rap. I think it's an overly bad rap sometimes in the in public perception. Cholesterol is necessary for every single cell membrane you have. Your body makes most of your own cholesterol. Um, it's a, you get a small fraction of your cholesterol from your diet. Most of your body's cholesterol comes from your liver. Big brown thing in your abdominal cavity. Cholesterol makes sure that your plasma membrane isn't too liquidy. You don't want it to be too dynamic. You want a, a degree of strength and stiffness, and cholesterol gives you that. All right, what about proteins? What about membrane proteins? There are two main types of membrane proteins. Integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Now, the word integral... What does that word mean? That word means important, right? Essential. Fundamental. Okay? The word integral means basically... Think about the word integer. You guys love math. I'm, I'm assuming you're nodding your head right now. An integer is a whole number. So an integral protein is a part of the whole membrane, okay? So this guy right here, this is an integral protein. It's part of the, the whole membrane. Another integral protein right here. Another integral protein over here. Another one right here. By the way, this integral protein has a, a hole running through it. You can probably guess what that's going to be for. So integral proteins stretch into the wall. Okay, you might have an integral protein that doesn't quite stick out on both sides. Boom, boom, boom. Like that would be an integral protein too. It doesn't have to go perfectly all the way through, but it's got to get into the wall. Now this guy, this beautiful little lima bean right here, this guy is a peripheral protein. It is a peripheral protein. What does the word peripheral mean, literally? Okay, it means on the periphery, right? What does that mean? Towards the outside, right? The peri part of the word periphery means around. The peri part of the word periphery means around. So a peripheral protein is not in the wall the way an integral protein is, but it is on the outside. Basically, peripheral means carried around. Periphery is carrying around, holding 
around, like holding on the outside. All right, enough word etymology fun. Oops, there we go. Some of our integral proteins, and we kind of alluded to this a moment ago, are transmembrane. Trans means across. So some integral proteins go all the way across the membrane. Like this guy right here, my favorite. This guy right here has a hole running through it. I know you already know why that hole is there. So transmembrane proteins can act as transport proteins. This means we can let things go. This guy, these guys can go from the outside, they're in the interstitial fluid, to the inside, into the intracellular fluid. That's what the word cytosol means, by the way, intracellular fluid. So integral proteins, transmembrane proteins, in fact, can allow for transport, can allow things to go through. This right here is a channel protein. We got to let certain things in. We got to let certain things out. All in the grand goal of maintaining homeostasis. Okay, well, what else can integral proteins do? Integral proteins can act as receptors. Look at the shape of the extracellular part of this, inter of this integral protein. It's going to bind to this signaling molecule right here. When the signaling molecule, maybe it's a, a protein, maybe it's a hormone, who knows? When the signaling molecule binds to our, to our integral protein, this integral protein is going to change shape. When that happens, this guy maybe might get released and then go and do something somewhere in the cell. So we are transmitting information with an integral protein. It's acting as a receptor, taking information from the outside of the cell to the inside. And this is not the only way it could happen where you know something detaches and goes somewhere else. It's just a possibility. All right. Okay. Well, what else can these transmembrane proteins do, these integral proteins? Oh, we got two cells right here. Check this out. Cell number one with his membrane. Cell number two with his membrane. Integral protein right here. Integral protein right here. The two integral proteins are locked together, which is locking the two cells together. All right, cells make tissues, right? Tissues are collections of cells. Well, something has got to hold cells together. This is one of the ways we do that. We have a pair of cell adhesion proteins. That's what they're called here, caps. And they are anchoring these two guys together. So that's another job of integral proteins. Or, or they can act as enzymes. You guys love chemistry. You know enzymes catalyze re chemical reactions. Sometimes you need to localize a chemical reaction. So what you do is you stick the enzyme in a particular spot in the membrane, right there, and then we can do that chemical reaction right there in that spot. Turn a substrate into a product, and that way we get the product right here where we want it. All right, lastly, lastly, some integral proteins, like this guy over here, act as structural proteins. Okay, you know this is anatomy and physiology. Anatomy, structure, physiology, function. We've established that those two things are related. That extends to cells. If we look at a red blood cell, a side view of a red blood cell, kind of resembles a dog bone, sort of. A red blood cell has this biconcave shape where it's punched in twice. That's crucial for the red blood cell's function to deliver oxygen throughout your body. That shape is maintained by a bunch of proteins. Imagine that there are proteins, let's make them a different color, that there are proteins right here and here and here and here, and also here, here, and here, and here. Then other proteins are connecting these guys, causing the middle of the cell to be kind of pulled in on itself. 
That's a stru- That's what structural proteins are doing, maintaining the structure of our cell, like our red blood cell here. Okay. Good, good, good. Some of our proteins, and some of our phospholipids for that matter, have a sugar attached to them. If they have a sugar attached to them, they are known as a glycoprotein or glycolipid. So this guy right here is a glycoprotein. He's a plasma pro, sorry, a, a membrane protein with a sugar, like a string of glucoses or fructoses attached to him. Over here, we have a glycolipid. No, sorry, that's not a glycolipid. Let's undo that one. I, there's my glycolipid right there. A phospholipid with a sugar chain attached to him. The sugar, by the way, is usually um, a string of monosaccharides. Okay, so a string of simple sugars. Now, the reason you put sugars on is it helps to create better receptors and also for recognition. Your pattern of sugars on the outside of your cells is often used to distinguish your cells from foreign cells. Well, what, what system would want to do that? What system would want to distinguish your cells from foreign cells? Give you a moment. The immune system, obviously, you're right. So these glycoproteins and glycolipids are also good at labeling our cells. Now, there is in fact a word for the entire collection of sugars on your individual cells. The collection of sugars on the outside of your cells is called the glycocalyx, the sugar coat. So I'm actually zooming in on an intestinal epithelial cell here. This is, this is an intestinal epithelial cell that I'm in, in the cytoplasm right here. Have you seen this picture before? Or one very, very similar? Think about the, the first epithelial lab we did. Go back and watch that video again. Can you tell me what these things are right here? Boom, boom. All of these sticky out things. Can you tell me what they are and where they're, why they're here? If you can't, go back and look at that first epithelial tissue lab, lab number three video. Anyway, the glycocalyx is the collection of sugars. Like we said, the sugars are there for recognition. But they also, and this makes beautiful sense, the sugars make the cells sticky, which is good for cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. Okay, so we actually had two ways cells can be, we can help stick cells together by their sugars and by their integral proteins. Awesome. We are going to, uh, there we go, keep on going. I just want to see how far along we are. Eh, we're not quite halfway there yet. We'll try and get halfway through and then we'll give you guys a break. All right, we were just talking about joining cells together. There are other ways to connect cells. In fact, there are three basic types of cell-to-cell -cell junctions we have to discuss. Three ways we hook cells together. Tight junctions, we mentioned those in the Lab 3 video. Desmosomes, also mentioned in the Lab 3 video, and gap junctions. Let's talk about all three of them. All right, we have opened up the ventral body cavity here. We have, we see the ventral body cavity. We see the diaphragm here. We see the abdominal pelvic cavity. We see the abdominal cavity. We see some mesentery in here as well. We see the visceral peritoneum on the outside of our organs. So one thing I like about doing these, these videos instead of being in the, the classroom is I have so much more time just to like, like go back to other older stuff. All right, here's our small intestine right here. 
This is the lining of our small intestine right here. Here's the lumen of our small intestine. That's some ugly writing right there. The lumen of the small intestine right there. This is the simple columnar epithelium lining the small intestine. Go back to lab three. We looked at this. Now, the cells in here. These are two of them. This is an intestinal epithelial cell. This is another intestinal epithelial cell. One of the ways we hook these cells together is via tight junctions. Tight junctions prevent nasty things. Let's say there was a giant bacterium right there. That's too big. Let's get rid of him. That's just not going to work. There's a bacterium. There it is. That little dot right there is a bacterium. Do we want the bacterium to be able to sneak through between the cells and get into the vascular connective tissue underneath? No, we don't. So what we do is we stick a tight junction between the two cells, makes it more or less impermeable, so that things cannot sneak through. Tight junctions are abundant in the epithelium of our small intestine. All right, that is one of the major ways we join cells together. Well, what else? How else do we do it? We do it with desmosomes. So I got some skin here. This is some skin. Let's take a moment. Look at that skin for a moment. Cells down here. Stratum basale. This stretch right here. Stratum granulosum. Now, I don't know why I wrote granulosum. I was thinking about the granulosum. And then, because uh, I was looking at it. My mind was getting ahead. My mouth was getting ahead of my... Uh, I don't know what was going on. This is stratum spinosum here. This is the stratum granulosum. This is the stratum corneum. I do not see any uh, stratum lucidum or hair, so thin skin. Now, skin cells, keratinocytes, keratin-making cells, are going to be held together. Look at these little dots right there. Those little dots right there are desmosomes. Desmosomes. There's a picture, a drawing. Not a picture. A drawing of a desmosome right there. Desmosomes are for stress resistance. So they make tissue stronger. They help prevent the breaking apart of tissues. Of, help prevent cells from pulling apart from one another. Desmosomes are very abundant. Sorry, adjusting my microphone right there. Desmosomes are very abundant in the skin. They're also abundant in the uterus of the cervix, which makes sense when we consider the stress placed upon it by delivery of a baby during that positive feedback process. You also find desmosomes linking heart muscle cells together, so their powerful contractions do not separate them. Okay, let's get rid of all that. The last one is the gap junction. So I got a cell on the left, I got a cell on the right. I got a series of integral proteins here in each of these cells. By the way, check out the phospholipid bilayer right there. Look at those guys. These are integral proteins. All these little blocks here are integral proteins. And I've created two channels, and I basically slammed the two channels together allowing free passage of materials with size and charge constraints, of course, from cell A to cell B. So gap junctions are there for cell-to-cell -cell communication. Gap junctions are often necessary when you have a large group of cells that have to work together. So great example is the muscle cells of your heart. The muscle cells in the iris, the, the colored part, brown, blue, green, whatever you got, of your eye. When cells have to work together, 
get junctions are often there because we can provide a quick link, a passage from cell to cell for an electrical signal or for some other chemical signal, which allows cells to work in unison. Yeah, there we go. There's a heart right there. The muscle of the heart. This is the muscle of the heart. And the gap junctions are actually in these pink things. We don't see gap junctions, but the gap junctions are in these pink things. Hey, by the way, when you take AMP2, you're going to see a picture just like this histology right here. And they're going to ask you what the point of the gap junctions are in here. And you're going to know it lets the heart muscle cells work together. Okay. We're actually going to quit quit right here. We're going to make this cells, membranes, transport lecture a two-video event. So we're going to stop right here, and I'll see you the next time we meet. As always, it's been fun. I'm looking forward to your emails. I will see you later. Bye-bye.